Hello, I'm David Hunt. Something extraordinary is going to be happening in Victoria that will change the, the course of the LGBTIQ plus community forever. This is a moment in history that we should all be very proud of. I'm talking about the Victorian Pride Centre. Along with uh, the board, there is another person that is going to be very much the front person of the community. This person will be running the centre, the CEO, on a day-to-day -day basis. And what a huge role and what a huge honour. And this person now will be part of the centre's history. I'm talking about the CEO of the Victorian Pride Centre, my very special guest today, Justine Dallariva. Hello. Hello, David, and thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And I, I think it's so important that our community get to know this person, that it's going to be, you're going to be there. You're, you're, you're there every day. You're going to be at the centre. Well, of course, you won't be there every day because you'll have time off. Uh, but you, you'll be there r running the show. And what a huge job you've got in front of you. But we'll get to that a little bit later because I really feel, and I know so many people want to know who you are and your history. Tell us, what were you like as a kid growing up? I grew up uh, in the, uh, out in Templestowe, uh, so I was one of uh, five, so part of a very large uh, Catholic family. I was pretty inquisitive uh, kind of kid. I was definitely uh, your quintessential tomboy, so a mad Carlton supporter. I loved the football. I loved sport in general. And but I also loved uh, being a part of uh, the community uh, that I was there in, uh, in terms of my education and, and my friendship group and also the, the church that my family went to. Community was an important aspect of my, my growing up and being a part of, of community. When I was 12 and in year seven, I uh, was off to um, uh, an all-girl school and uh, in one of our educational or religious education classes, uh, we were all asked, you know, what, what we wanted to be when, when we grew up and I had two things that I wanted to be. One was either a nun and the other was to be the, the first female winner of a Brownlow medal. So the, so the teacher at the time or the, the nun at the time uh, said to me, well, you could definitely do the nun, but there's no, you know, no way on earth you, you're ever going to win a brown loaf. So, I, you know, I took that a bit to heart and I thought, well, I don't know about that. So, you know, there's you know, still many years, you know, in me to be, to become a brown low medalist. And so I probably channeled a lot of, you know, wanting to win that Brownlow into uh, leadership roles within the, the school environment. So uh, I was very much uh, part of the Student Representative Council and captain of, of one of the sporting sporting teams. Uh, and so often, you know, played a bit of a leadership role at school, maybe because I was, you know, looking forward to, be, to being that winner of the Brownlow. For starters, down for um, Carlton. I'm a Collingwood supporter, the best team in the league, of course. But what what a wonderful thing to actually want to be, you know, like a Brownlow medalist. And now women um, AFL is there and off and running. So a great, you know, like great times ahead. When did the realization that, that you might have been, um, you know, like attracted to women where, where did that come to play for you from the very beginning so I remember uh, even in primary school being very much connected to uh, to my female friends so I, I would get crushes on on my female friends rather than um, you know my male friends and while 
I didn't, you know, at that age understand exactly what was going on. Um, you know, those feelings, you know, just stayed with me throughout my throughout my adolescence. When I got to, you know, sort of year 12, you know, I started to understand, you know, more clearly about my identity. And I, you know, that was that was a very difficult and challenging time because what I was also understanding was that, you know, having having a, a, a an identity that aligned, you know, around same sex attraction uh, was not something that I was going to be um, able to articulate or communicate because of my connection to to my religion and to my to my church and 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 my school for that matter so i suppose i spent quite a lot of time um putting that to the side and really it wasn't uh, until i uh, got to university uh where i was meeting you know a whole range of diverse people um people who were very proud of who they were and proud of their uh, sexuality that I was able to start to, I suppose, put 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 aside some of the shame, put a, put aside, understand the shame and and why I was having feelings of shame and that I didn't really um, deserve to feel to feel like that or to feel like I had to, you know, make a choice between. Uh, being part of a religious community uh, and being equal or being respected. So uh, during university, I, you know, my friendship group uh, expanded. I, I met my first girlfriend, uh, but unfortunately for my for my girlfriend as well, she was in a similar circumstance and so wasn't wasn't out to her wasn't out to her family. So in a sense, we we kind of lived you know, a very sort of closed relationship, uh, not, you know, our families knew that we were good friends, but we couldn't really articulate or say, you know, the level of our friendship and our commitment to each other. And in the end, it really did have a have an impact. And, and after five years of being together, I decided that, you know, that, that in order to be who I, who I wanted to be and to be respected and feel equal that I had to I had to come out and I had to um, articulate that and if that meant that we couldn't be together because she wasn't prepared to do the same thing then you know I had to make that choice for myself. Who did you come out to first was it your parents? I actually came out to my to um, my sister or one of my sisters um, and unfortunately, it wasn't a great um, experience. She um, did the typical "it's just a phase" uh, type thing, a university, a university phase, and so it did mean that uh, for another year or so, uh, I didn't come out to anybody else. I, I suppose it, you know, it was one of those experiences where um, it has an impact on you, and then you've got to go away and process it, and it can take some time. To build the courage up again to to come out and to articulate, you know, who you are, and so in the end, uh, it did take me another couple of years before I actually uh, came out to my parents. And this was uh, at the end of you know, sort of the relationship had ended, and I decided that it was time for me uh, to spread my wings and to experience more of the world. And so I was uh, going to. Uh, fly over to to Europe and to live in in Europe for a number of years, and I took the <laughs> I took the opportunity a little bit um, sneakily to to come out to my parents and then um, you know rack off very quickly afterwards um, because I did you know I I also had this thought that that if the the response was going to be uh, uh, not what I not what I'd hoped or if you know, they were going to ostracise me or do, you know, uh, that that if I if I did it and then I wasn't there, it would give them an opportunity and a time to, to reflect themselves on what was important to them. It was I more important to have in their, you know, in their lives and be part of, 
be part of the family than be, you know, than be gone. So, so I suppose I, I, I did it also thinking that it would give them an opportunity to, to, you know, reflect and think about um, what was important to them. How did they react when you told them? It was interesting in the sense that um, uh, I I was sitting on the couch in our family home uh, and I was telling mum and my dad was walking around sort of in the, in the background kind of hovering and when I said to said to mum you know that that you know I was a lesbian and that uh, I'd been in a relationship with my good friend, you know, mum wasn't surprised and dad's reaction was, oh, has she finally got around to dropping the dropping the bomb or dropping the bombshell? So, you know, so, so of course they, you know, they knew, um, but in, you know, in some families they like to not know for a period of time and then, um, but like most things, in order to be, you know, your authentic uh, true self, you have to be true to the people that um, you care about and and who are closest to you. And I think, you know, what it did was, you know, open up the, finally open up the conversation. And interestingly enough, many years later, when my mum was diagnosed with um, terminal cancer and uh, she was in the, in the hospital um, quite soon after being first diagnosed, I went to see her uh, uh, at lunch. I, you know, she was in the hospital in the city, and so I came up from work and um, popped in to see her and, and have a chat. That uh, mum, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, um, wanted to apologise for the fact that you know I'd spent a significant part of my adolescence and young adulthood having to lie, having. Um, to do things on my own and not being, you know, not not having her uh, or dad there to be able to to talk things through, and that she was really sorry about that. And and you know, for me, that was a really significant uh, point in in our relationship, but also uh, in her, I suppose, reflecting on her own on her own life and at times where. You know, and she could have done, you know, done differently. That would would have been a very moving moment for you when she said that to you, uh, because with, with you even telling me that just then, I was very moved by that because most parents would go, yeah, okay, let's move on, and it was gorgeous the fact that your father said it's about about time, uh, and. But what a sweet thing for your mum to say at a time like that. That that must have been a beautiful moment for you. Yeah, it truly was, David. And I think, uh, in terms of where I am now and and working for the for the Pride Centre, it it helped me sort of reflect on and and think about what what I what was I doing in terms of work, and you know, I'd always had a connection. With say rain, you know, with rainbow families, but but I had never done anything uh, within community that would, you know, that had a, uh, I suppose that that would have an impact in the same way that you know having that experience with mum would have. And so when when I knew that the Pride Centre was sort of coming and that there were opportunities to work uh, for the Pride Centre. You know, I, t- I took a risk and I, I sort of put myself uh, forward for the communications role, uh, which was a, a consultant role at the time, um, because I just I, I just saw that there, there was this amazing centre that was going to be built that would mean that, that people like, like me potentially wouldn't need to, you know, wait until... You know, many many years later, for a parent to say such a thing, because we would have a centre where I would have gone and and talked to people, gotten support or you know counselling about ways to to approach my parents or to bring my parents you know along along the journey with me earlier. Absolutely beautiful. Um, are you in a relationship now? Or <laughs> did that scar you for life, or are you? You know, like, did you end up finding a soul partner? I certainly did, David. So I, I got on that plane and I, I went to Europe and uh, I worked in London for a couple of years and uh, took a weekend to, to Amsterdam 
um, for a short you know, holiday break. And the thing I loved about Amsterdam, and this is also why I'm so excited about the Pride Centre, um, was, you, you know, you, you arrived at the, the train station in Amsterdam, you grabbed your, your map of the gay, um, uh, gay and lesbian bars and clubs and then you you know you just walked the streets and so you know I grabbed I grabbed my map and went into the went into the first bar it was about a five five o'clock in the afternoon so really far too early um, and there were a couple of gorgeous uh, drag queens at the bar who took one look at me and said darling you are not supposed to be here you need to be in the bar around the corner so they got the map out and they circled for me which bar was actually for me and that I would find, you know, my love, you know, in that bar and off I went and lo and behold, that, you know, that night a couple of hours later, uh, this stunning um, dyed blonde hair uh, Dutch woman on rollerblades rollerbladed into the, into the bar and I plucked up enough courage um, uh, to go up and introduce myself and to ask, you know, where, where do you dance here in Amsterdam? Where can you go out and dance? And uh, she said to me, well, I, I, don't, I, I don't dance, but I can ask my friend. And she did, and then she said, and I'll also take you there. So we're now together for over 20 years and uh, we Whoa. have a couple Whoa. of gorgeous children. I lived in Amsterdam uh, for a, a couple of years uh, after we met. Uh, so I moved from London to Amsterdam. Uh, and after a while, I was getting a little bit homesick and I asked my partner, you know, if she would consider coming to Melbourne because I always felt that it was important that in, in our relationship to understand a little bit who you are and what you're about, you need to experience that culture and that, that language. And so would, you know, would she consider coming to, to Melbourne for a period of time? Uh, and I was lucky in the sense that she, uh, she did and she was, and you know, that's, yeah, that's about 17 years ago. So, yeah. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got, I got the partner and, and I got all the antiques. So I was yeah, <laughs> very lucky. <laughs> uh, so when, when you all of a sudden thought, okay, I'm going to apply for the big job, the CEO, what qualifications have you got in the past that put you instead for, for this role or did they just know because they, you were already working with them that you were the perfect person? Uh, no, I think the the board. We, you know, there was a whole process, a, a transparent um, uh, process, and the, the board went to market, and that was always going to be, um, I think, a part of the part of the process. And given the importance of the role, as you've pointed, David, it was, you know, it was important that that there was an opportunity for other people to, you know, throw their hat in in the ring, and and having done the the acting role for a period of time, I felt um, that I felt confident that I could also throw throw my hat in the ring and and give it a you know a red hot go. So I feel that that having gone through that that process, it was a great opportunity to also articulate um, what what my vision was for the centre. Uh, I've always worked for small um, emerging organisations, so so in Amsterdam. I was really lucky to establish the the communications and PR department of bookings.com and this was at the beginning when the organization was uh, starting to be to become a more global organization and and you know some people you know always ask me why did I ever leave and <laughs> well you know we make we make choices and we we move on and and while it was a great experience for me, the other important uh, part around my professional career aspirations is, is that I have to work for a, a values-based organisation. I have to work for something that makes a meaningful difference to people's lives. And the Pride Centre uh, was just too 
a, a, too much of an amazing opportunity not not to try, not to to throw my hat in the ring, mm-hmm. to miss an opportunity that that you know to be a part and and to lead the you know lead the activation of what will be Australia's first purpose built LGBTIQ community hub. You just got to try. You've just got to step up, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. And. And so while, you know, I've got a, you know, master's degree in marketing and I'm doing graduate diploma in um, uh, governance and um, I continue to add to my hex debt, I do love, I do love learning. It's those experiences of, of really understanding what it means and, and what it takes to build an emerging organisation. And, and the other thing is, I think that's, that's a really important aspect of the role and part of who I am is is that I roll my sleeves up and I get the you know I get the job done. It's not for me. This is not a role that you can you know delegate to everybody because we don't have everybody to delegate to. You've really got you've got to do the hard yards as well. Um, and you know and and I grew up you know with a very strong work ethic, so it it suits me as well. Here, here you are, you want a Brownlow medal, but you're not going to get that because you're now too old to be playing women's um, AFL. But, hey, there might be um, an, another league there. You've found your yeah. partner 20 years. You, know, like you, you said you've got a couple of kids and the antiques. Uh, you bar it for the wrong football team, but that I, I yes. can't you know, like blame <laughs> you're you gonna for You're going to give me that. <laughs> um, but what was the feeling like, Justine, when all of a sudden you got that telephone call or was it an email saying you've got the role? It was significant, David. It was it was a mixture of excitement and fear. So excitement to know that you know this opportunity was mine and and that I, you know, need to take it with both hands. And a little bit of fear because uh, it's such an important centre and such an important uh, vision that we're trying to create yeah. that, you know, there's a lot of expectation. And so, and, you know, I, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I don't like, you know, so I don't like the idea of letting, you know, letting people down or not, um, you know, not doing the best I can. So I do, you know, I do think there's 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 a bit of both. It's a... It's a role that's the most that's going to be the most challenging, but also the most rewarding one I've ever had. It's a role that you have to be a particular person. And just this interview today, I have the total confidence that you are the right person uh, for this role. And even the follow through on on uh, doing this interview with me, I was very very impressed. I want to ask you, um, you know, like. Can you do it in a couple of sentences? What do you see for this centre? How do you explain it to a person walking down the street and they go, what's this building all about? What do you say? That's a really great question, David, because I think for a lot of people, you know, it's not clear and it hasn't been completely clear what what happens in this building. And I think what I would say is that the vision is the centre's going to be, you know, the most loved, well-known and visited home of the LGBTIQ community. And that's because when you unpack a vision like that from both a strategic and operational perspective, I, I see an all, you know, a centre that empowers individuals and communities to fully engage in society by providing a place where people are valued, respected, celebrated and safe. So it's a place of social connection, a place of welcome, a place where our LGBTIQ organisations can continue to do what they do and impact on the wellbeing and lives of LGBTIQ Australians. I mentioned in my little intro that you're now part of history. Uh, that, you know, like the centre's history is going to have first CEO, your name's going to be there. You know, like the first uh, Pride Centre in Australia, the building alone is spectacular. 
Uh, mm. I, I've seen it uh, come from the ashes and 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 it's just spectacular. It's going to win every award next year, all the <laughs> architectural awards, because it's so spectacular. The board did a magnificent job on choosing because there was a competition, uh, mm. if I've got it right, uh, to choose. Yeah. Um, I think there was three or four uh, that they had to choose from uh, and um, they've done a brilliant job because it is a very, very special building uh, and uh, and you're know, like it, it's just one of those things that we're we're just going to be all blown away and swept away with um, how how important it is and the fact is that this is our building. That's so true, David. And I, when when you talk about something being iconic, I don't think you can go past the the Pride Centre. And uh, you know, I've often said to people when. You know, people have asked about you know how much how much the building cost. Uh, I say that you know, and and maybe this is reflective also of my own um, experience that that it's it's about how much we're worth. That that as a community, we're worth a building of this scale and beauty. And uh, and so I think to make a statement like that. It, it does communicate more broadly that that we value ourselves and that we want the broader community to value us just as much. And part of the the activation of the the Pride Centre will be about bringing the broader community in as well. So so I would hope that you know many locals on uh, in St Kilda will be coming into the Pride Centre for their their morning coffee, uh, so that they uh, or they visit you know. Uh, the retail space at the back, or come to a come to an event in the in the multi-purpose space, or have a drink on the on the rooftop, or or even rent the rent the rooftop for their own um, birthday party. That that it it will bring you know not just the LGBTIQ community together, but but our our broader community because we we play a really important part. And also, we we've got to be so thankful. Of the insight of the our state government and the the council, the city of Port Phillip, um, who uh, purchased the land for it to happen, uh, but you know, like the the commitment from our state government is really it's it's just humbling that they they're putting this much faith in our community and they want to be there and support our community, and the fact is that generations to come. It's going to be there for, you know, like that that kid that, you know, like it is getting easier and easier coming out, yeah. but there's going to be a kid that's going to struggle. And as you mm-hmm. said, that they can come there and and there'll be counsellors there. There'll be just just sitting in the um, the common areas. Uh, you, you'll get a vibe that you know, I'm not alone. We've had so so much great support, um, you know, from the from the state government, from the equality branch, from from the commissioner, of course, Ro Allen's been uh, a huge uh, supporter of the of the centre in terms of you know pushing through and getting to getting to where we are. Uh, the city of Port Phillip. I, I remember at a, um, a consultation that was was held a couple of uh, years ago. Where the where the commissioner spoke and said how fantastic it was that uh, that that we had four different you know LGAs all vying to have the to have the, to have a pride centre, whereas you know ten years ago they would have all said, oh no, we don't you know we don't want it here, we don't want it here. So that that level of support is it, it just puts puts the centre in such great stead. To, to broaden out that support and to seek, you know, to connect with uh, a whole range of different uh, other stakeholders outside of the, the LGBTIQ community. Uh, I've had yep. the opportunity uh, since taking the role uh, of presenting to the City of Port Phillips multicultural uh, group and multi-faith group. Uh, and so talking to uh, representatives of different uh, religious uh, faiths about how they might engage with the centre and come in and um, utilise some of the the meeting rooms or the um, or the the multi-purpose 
uh, or even you know come to some events where uh, we can connect uh, different uh, multi faith groups together. So it's been I think will be part of uh, this first sort of phase of activation around how we bring a whole range of different groups and organisations, small LGBTI, you know, Q, Q sporting groups and arts groups and culture groups together into the centre and how we can support them to, to utilise it, to, to help shape that vision and get, get to that vision. I hear the comments because I live literally at the back of the centre. I hear the comments on a daily basis when I'm, I'm walking up and down the street where people are just talking about it. The general public uh, are talking about, oh, I didn't think it was going to be this big. It's really grown yes. since the last time I walked out the street. And, you know, like, and what are, are they balconies up there? You know, we'll, yes. are they yeah. viewing spots for Pride March or, you know, like, and, or functions? And then, you know, quite often I'll um, have a chat with them and say, yeah, you know, like there's functions and this, that and the other. And uh, it, it is really becoming a landmark already um, in the city of Port Phillip and for the, uh, the greater Melbourne as well. Uh, and, and that's what makes it so exciting, uh, Justine, isn't it? Is that, as, as you said, you, know, like you want all different um, uh, groups to, to use the centre uh, and, uh, and it sounds as if it, it's going to work like a charm. You know, it will be a beacon. So while the, you know, the first year will be, you know, first year to two years will be um, understanding how how the centre works, how people will you know access the centre, how the how the you know amazing resident organisations like Thorn Harbour Health and Monash Gender Clinic minus eighteen, Joy FM, Switchboard, Melbourne Queer Film Festival, the archives, the fantastic queer archives, how how each of each of those organisations will also utilise the the centre. You know that first couple of years we'll really be looking at at how yeah how how we create that vibrancy and that that welcoming and, and safe um, safe space and then more broadly about how can we be a beacon to communities you know outside of um, Australia. So much to look forward to. Um, boy, have you got a big job in front of you? Thank you so much, David. I, I think you know the 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 goodwill and the uh, collaborative uh, approach of of all of the organisations to date. Uh, everybody has has a vested commitment and and passion to see the centre um, a, a success. And you know, for me in my position, um, that gives me a sense of, of confidence. So. It is, you know, it will be a tough job, but there are so many people there uh, who are already doing such amazing work to help to help me and to help the organisation be successful. Justine Della Riva, thank you so much. CEO, Victorian Pride Centre. What a title! What an amazing title! And what a, a treat it was chatting with you today. Thank you so much for talking on Ben TV. I'm David Hunt. And we'll be back real soon with another great person from our community.